very much, Tony, for, for the very kind invitation to speak here today. Um, yes, I am aware that this being July, although one wouldn't know it from the weather outside, that um, I'm delighted that so many people were, were able to make it. Um, really, what I'd like to do today is, is, is take a look at four conflicts that mm -hmm. currently um, still exist in Southeast Europe that need to be addressed, um, Cyprus, uh, Kosovo, FYR Macedonia and Bosnia, and trying to link this into a, a broader theme, if you like, of how the European Union has tried to manage these conflicts. And really, you know, what I, I, I'd really like to say in this is that, you know, we are definitely looking at a European Union in crisis in so many ways, and I wish I could come with some positive news, but I think when, even when we look at conflict management, um, the European Union is in a, a, a terrible state at the moment. Um, and really what I'd like to do is, is flesh out some of the reasons why that's the case and maybe um, sort of hint at some ideas as to how we might resolve it. And I think the reason this is so very important is that, um, above all, the European Union, as we all know, was found as a conflict management mechanism. And that's always been sold as its greatest benefit, um, the greatest good that it's managed to deliver to Europe. And yet we can see that in Southeast Europe, for, for reasons, and, and a lot of very complex reasons, um, it's failed to deliver. Um, and I'd really like to have a look at that. And I, I think the sort of the three arguments that I, I'd essentially make is that I think part of the problem is that European Union's unclear about its conflict aims. What does it want to do? Tied in with that, it's unclear about its enlargement aims that it can't actually do a lot unless it actually takes a very clear position on what it wants to do, which countries it wants to admit, and offer them a much clearer perspective. But also, I think that we've seen certain incidents um, over the past few years where the European Union has fundamentally under, under, undermined its normative power. Its ability to go out into the wider world and say, we are a force for good, we represent and uphold international law, we support multilateral institutions. Um, and I'll, I'll explain specifically in the context of Kosovo where we've, we've created a problem. I think really where I'd like to start is on, on the Cyprus problem. Um, as many of you might be aware, I mean, this is now in, in the bizarre situation that we are now facing almost 50 years of UN peacemaking efforts on the island. Um, I simply don't have the time to sort of go into a full history of the island, but suffice it to say, um, one of the big arguments that was made was that Europe made a terrible mistake taking a divided island in, in, in 2004. Um, my view on that is actually that we, we essentially have two questions there um, that need to be looked at. Um, the first is, did the European Union make a mistake in opening up accession talks with Cyprus? Absolutely not, is the simple answer. Um, we have to look at the situation, the conditions that existed when the European Union took that decision. Um, at that point, it was very clear from all sorts of UN um, accounts, from the accounts of senior international officials who've been working on Cyprus, that the fault lay with the Turkish Cypriot leadership and with the Turkish government. Um, and that it was simply unacceptable to be able to punish the Greek Cypriots for the position that was taken by, by the Turkish government, by the Turkish Cypriots. Also, there was a greater issue at stake. That what does it, how does the European Union allow to have veto powers over who can and cannot join the European Union? It was completely unacceptable to allow the third country, Turkey in this case, to determine who the European Union could and couldn't accept. And I think that one has to measure that against an, another important debate that was taking place at the time, which was obviously the Baltic Republics. If we allowed Turkey to have a say on whether Cyprus could or couldn't join, were we going to give Russia a say into who could and couldn't join the European Union? So I think from that context, it's, it's, it's cut and dry. We did not make a mistake. Where we did make a mistake, I think, um, and this is something that we do have to bear in mind with the other conflicts that I'm going to talk about, is um, we didn't put in place proper safeguards to make sure that all parties to the conflict could be kept on track right up to the moment of accession. Mm -hmm. Essentially, the problem that was created was that from the moment that the Republic of Cyprus signed the Treaty of Accession in April 2003 until it joined in May 2004, there was no institutional leverage that the EU could exert over the Greek Cypriots. And they knew this. This was stated to me by officials from the Commission. They had looked into this, but it was simply Cyprus fell into an odd period of limbo. 
and it couldn't be disentangled from the overall process of membership of the other nine countries that joined on the 1st of May 2004. And so hence we had this big problem and I, I would say that one of the key things that the European Union needs to consider, because it will encounter these problems in the Balkans, um, is how do you put in place certain mechanisms that make sure that you keep both parties to a conflict on track and then try and make sure that when one of them joins the European Union, it doesn't have the ability um, to then um, undermine the membership of the other. It's a very complex question, and I, I'm happy to take some questions on this as to, you know, it's not as simple as it sounds. Um, but I think that this is one of the key lessons that we've learned from Cyprus. The problem we have now at the moment, of course, is that the talks have resumed. They've been going on for three years. They show very little prospect of being resolved. In part, um, one must uh, accept that this is because, obviously, Cyprus is a member of the European Union and obviously feels that its institutional position, its leverage has strengthened significantly. Um, and that's obviously creating terrible problems in terms of Turkish membership. Um, we look as though we might have a further crisis next year. In the past couple of year, uh, days, the Turkish foreign minister has said that um, during the period of Cyprus's presidency of the European Union in the second half of next year, um, Turkey will not... Um, retain any institutional links with the European Union at the highest level in terms of the presidency because they don't recognise the Republic of Cyprus. They'll continue to work with the Commission but they won't, they'll have to freeze contacts with the presidency. So obviously that's, um, you know, the ongoing situation in Cyprus is, is, is one that um, keenly affects EU decision making. I think where Cyprus is, 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 is potentially um, very interesting as well is um, with what we've seen in Kosovo. The Cyprus lesson, if you like, um, is that we cannot afford to take in another country with a, a, a border dispute, a territorial dispute. Um, and so what we're now seeing is that argument applied to Serbia's membership of the European Union and the question of Kosovo. I actually think that that's a, a fundamentally unfair position to take. Um, for reasons I'm happy to go into, uh, the Artisari status process was one of the most flawed and unfair um, diplomatic mediation efforts of recent times. Um, it was very clear that although he was mandated by the UN Security Council and by the Secretary General to enter into a period of mediation with um, Serbia and um, Pristina, um, he didn't do so. There was never any intention to try and find anything other than independence. He'd made up his mind and he sought to implement it. And I think that, um, you know, this is an area where the European Union missed an opportunity to show some real leadership on its own part. Um, effectively, it allowed the status process um, to be held hostage by the United States and Russia. And they thought of this in simple terms of independence or not independence. And I think that the European Union um, really had the opportunity to come in and do what a lot of people argue that it does best, which is come up with innovative, inventive ideas for how you manage questions of sovereignty. Um, and, and it failed miserably to do so. Um, what is worse in my mind is that this process was then, um, was then led by the United States, which felt that there was no alternative to Kosovo's independence. And a number of key members of the European Union took the same line. And so what we ended up with is um, an outcome that I believe is contrary to international law. Now, I know that people immediately say, but the ICJ said that it wasn't. No, the ICJ didn't say nothing along those lines. The ICJ actually, on the question of the legality of Kosovo's statehood, decided it wasn't going to deal with the question at all. Instead, it took a very different position, which was on the Declaration of Independence. And again, I'm, I'm happy to discuss that a bit further. Um, in order to support the position on Kosovo, um, an argument was made that it amounted to a su sui generis case in international law. Um, that argument is, for want of another word, nonsense. Um, you can't create that argument. And uh, there, there were three basic reasons for this. One, they argued the constitutional status of Kosovo under the 1974 Yugoslav constitution. Um, Kosovo was not a federal republic. It had many of the rights. Um, but it missed out on, on several key elements of it. Um, and I think that that's, if you start then extending rights of independence to territories um, which fall below a federal status, which do not have um, rights um, of secession as 
the six republics had under the constitution, well, it was a little bit more complicated than that, um, then you're going to start opening up problems in, in various other conflict resolution circumstances. The second question was on human rights abuses and the right of the Kosovo Albanians to have independence on that. Um, again, I find this an extremely troubling position to take, especially in the context, for example, of Cyprus. We know full well that there were terrible abuses of Turkish Cypriots in the 1960s, and yet we asked them to overcome the past and engage in a process of reunification with the Greek Cypriots. In 2004, remembering that the Greek Cypriots were led by somebody who had actually been very closely implicated in some of the worst atrocities committed against Turkish Cypriots in the 1960s. We were asking them to reunite um, with a, a, a leader at the helm who they fundamentally mistrusted and distrusted. Um, and thirdly, there's the element of UN administration, that because Kosovo had been under UN administration, that this somehow created the conditions um, for, for Kosovo to be granted independence. Again, one can see very clearly where the problem arises if you take that line of thought. Um, you then make it almost impossible for the UN to be able to engage in other conflicts around the world. What country is going to want to accept a UN force, UN administration, if they feel that this is going to follow the Kosovo precedent. And I think also for the European Union, there was a very troubling aspect in all of this, in as much as they were willing um, key states to undermine the Security Council in order to pursue this. Now, they might not have been happy with the fact that Russia was exercising a veto over Kosovo's independence, but that was Russia's prerogative to do so under the UN Charter. If Britain wants to ob object to something and use its veto... It has the right to do so, and it, it expects that that's going to be respected. The United States, China, France all expect the same. Now, one might not like this system for the UN Security Council, but it's the system that exists, and it's the system that we agree to abide by. And once you get into a situation where some countries can say, well, look, we feel that another country has been obstructed, so we're going to simply bypass the Security Council, I think was an extremely dangerous precedent to set, and, and, and certainly for the European Union, I think is going to undermine its position on the world stage. And I think now we're in a situation that having created this problem with Kosovo, um, we're now trying to force Serbia to accept it. Um, and I think that this is where, all right, we've seen some very positive developments with the, the recent um, dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina. And I, I do believe that you know, this is the right way to go at the moment. But at the same time, um, we can see very troubling aspects that EU states are now putting pressure on Serbia to accept um, Kosovo's independence and, um, for, for example, recently a, a, parliamentar a delegation of German parliamentarians said that Serbia wouldn't be able to join um, the European Union. They would block it unless it recognised Kosovo. And frankly, I, I just cannot see that Serbia is going to relent on this issue. It will go a very, very long way towards normalising a relationship with Kosovo. But if it comes down to the crunch, that it has to recognise Kosovo in terms if it wants to join the European Union. I don't think that's going to happen. I think that people will resist it. It's, um, it. It will be seen as humiliating. People feel very unhappy about what happened with Artisari, um, and I think that this pressure would then seem, seem to tip things. Um, so I do seriously believe that we, we still need to reach some sort of consen consensual solution in, in Kosovo. I believe it's possible, but I think, again, that the European Union is going to have to take a far more active approach and actually be willing to take a, a, a joint decision on how do we get to a position where we reach a consensual solution between the parties. The third case is Bosnia. Um, and here again, I think we see interesting parallels with, with Cyprus and um, the effects of the Kosovo unilateral declaration of independence. Um, it's caused a lot of resentment amongst um, Bosnian Serbs um, who see it as being a case that the Kosovo Albanians are entitled to independence. Why aren't they? Interestingly, though, one of the strongest Serbian voices in favour of an independent Kosovo is Milorad Dodik, who's president of Republika Srpska because he, quite, he can very obviously see the parallels that can be drawn in this, and telling Serbia, forget Kosovo, concentrate on, on us, um, that, that we should be your real target. You, why do you want to keep hold of Kosovo with Kosovo Albanians? Why, you know, why not concentrate more on, on, on some sort of functional relationship between Serbia and um, Republika Srpska? So in that sense, I think that uh, the argument that Kosovo's move to independence 
should be a source of stability. I think um, you know, the argument that was put forward by a lot of countries that supported um, Kosovo's independence, I think we can see is, 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 is rather hollow, certainly in the case of Bosnia. And the problem we have with Bosnia is that, you know, by all accounts, it is a dysfunctional state which is making no progress towards the European Union at the moment. And this is not just simply a a problem that exists between Republika Srpska and the Federation, but I think we've also seen very serious problems emerging within uh, the Federation itself. Um, We've now had a number of months since there were major elections in the country and there is still no government. Um, We had the um, foreign minister of Bosnia come and speak to us um, uh, a few weeks ago, and he suggested that we couldn't expect to have a government in in Bosnia until, well, now, I guess, the middle of September at the earliest. Um, And so this is naturally having a major effect on, in terms of Bosnia's relationship with the European Union. Um, It's unable to engage in a lot of the processes that it needs to to try and take its its succession process forward. Um, And here again, I I think, you know, in terms of how the European Union deals with this, we have got very serious questions about international oversight of of Bosnia. Is it too early to pull it out? Have we got beyond a stage now where it can function um, reasonably? But I think there's also another element in all of this, which is as we think a little bit about how we try and deal with the constitutional problems that exist um, between the parties in Bosnia, is that European Union has got to be extremely careful in how it manages this. It's got to avoid being seen to take one side or another um, in, in its position. And this is, this is a real danger, as highlighted. Um, a co- commission officials have said that they feel that you know, this, is, this is something that um, has got to be watched out for because it's very easy to get dragged into constitutional debates. Um, that one side will say, we need to centralise in order um, to meet European criteria. The other one will say, well, absolutely not. This isn't something the European Union demands central decision-making on. And the European Union will be called upon to pronounce on this. And I think the danger is if it's seen to take one side over another, if it's seen to promote a gender of increased centralisation on issues which don't actually require centralisation under um, EU um, norms, then I think it's going to be seen as being, um, well, a a biased actor um, in in the process. And I think that 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 will will actually make the situation um, worse rather than better. So we've really got to deal as a priority with um, trying to get the constitution in in order to deal with those questions which fundamentally affect um, Bosnia's process of accession to the European Union. And the EU's got to act as a much more neutral partner in, in, in doing so. Of course, there's the greater question of, of whether Bosnia is, is, is really viable. Um, a number of people have asked the question of whether maybe it would be simply better to let it split. Um, obviously, it's an extremely contentious um, discussion. But I think um, relating it back to Cyprus, one of the things that um, perhaps we should consider is that is the current, the present of, of Bosnia the future of Cyprus? And that then opens up questions about um, how perhaps we look at um, trying to deal with Cyprus. I'll try and wrap all this up um, in, in a conclusion and sort of come up with some answers, I, I think, that, um, that deal with this, this, what we can see a very clear paradox um, emerging. Finally, we have Macedonia. Um, the name issue rumbles on. Uh, it shows no immediate sign of being solved. Um, efforts are still continuing. Uh, it, it strikes many people as... as extremely strange to put it mildly that this issue has been allowed to go on for as long as it has but uh, it's actually a little bit more complex than just the name of the country apparently the the sticking point tends to relate more to relevant adjectives Um, so it's fine for the country to accept to call itself um, northern macedonia um, but they will certainly not accept that their language is northern macedonian that they will call themselves Northern Macedonians. This is, this is unacceptable. And apparently, when, when a country applies to join um, the United Nations, it has to fill out a very, sh- basically, one side of A4, giving some, some fundamental details about the country, capital city, size of population. An adjective is one of those. And apparently, that is one of the key sticking points. Um, there is actually a, 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 a very obvious example around this. Um, that, that you can take, which is the British example, um, where, of course, British is not officially um, the, the relevant adjective. It's United Kingdom. Um, and so um, that argument has been put forward, but it doesn't really wash with the Macedonians. Um, and, and so that that's, 
has, has retained a problem. If anything, the matter is getting worse because we're seeing an increase in nationalism in the country. Um, you might have heard that there's appropriations of, of sort of Greek archaeological sites. They're now calling them Macedonian. Mm. They're building up a, a massive statue of Alexander the Great in the middle of, of Skopje. All this is serving to make relations with Greece that much more fraught at a time, I think, when Greece, frankly, would like to solve this issue and put it out of the way. But again, you know, this in many ways is a sideshow. The far more serious issue that's affecting the country is the dispute between the, the majority Slavic Macedonian and the minority Albanian co- community. Um, we saw this erupt into violence about 10 years ago, um, and a lot of observers still are very worried um, that ethnic tensions may re-emerge um, in the country and that this is something that's got to be addressed so really, um, what I'd like to do, sort of just by way of wrapping things up before having, having a discussion on, on more of the details of these, is really to say that you know, I, I do believe, despite the way that looking at how the European Union has tried to deal with all of these, that the European Union does remain potentially an extremely powerful force for solving regional conflicts in Southeast Europe. I think it's got the, potentially got the mechanisms there. Um, I certainly don't believe that it's a panacea. The argument that the European Union can simply solve ethnic conflicts, I think, is, is, is wrong. It, doesn't, it, can, it can take away, if you like, the most acidic elements of these conflicts. But I think we can see um, that sovereignty still matters. The flag that flies over a piece of territory matters to people. And so it might be a European Union flag that flies, but next to it will be a state flag. And I think that this certainly has, has a, a great effect. And we mustn't underestimate that um, in, in, in any way. Um, we can see it here um, but we do also see it very clearly in South Southeast Europe and I think what more worryingly if you like um, is that we can see that the EU doesn't quite know how it wants to approach conflict in Southeast Europe on the one hand there's very powerful forces calling for reunification it's doing this in Cyprus it's taking a very strong position that the Greek and Turkish Cypriots must Reunify. They must get past their, past their problems, work out a system for coexistence, cohabitation. But at the same time, as we saw in Kosovo, they've been willing to endorse a division, saying that it's absolutely not possible for two peoples to, to get past their, their problems, um, that they, they've got to be allowed to go their own, their own way. And I think that this has created a, a real mess. It sends out very, very strong mixed messages about what we're trying to do. Now, I wouldn't actually propose that we take one or other position. I think that this is actually where the European Union falls into a problem. Where I think it's far more effective is that if it says, let's take two fundamental principles in how we deal with conflicts. We're not going to propose an outcome what we're going to do is facilitate process and stick to two basic rules in doing so. Adherence to international law and a respect for democratic values. So, for example, acts of unilateral secession are, are, are not accepted under international law. There's a whole body of legal literature which, um, which I can refer you to which makes this very clear. However, to simply say that um, territory should be held together, even when it's quite clear that the overwhelming majority of the population desires a different outcome, I think is untenable and doesn't actually hold to the sort of democratic values um, that we expect. And I think that this has, you know, we can see this shaping, if you like, positions in, in, in various countries, most obviously Canada. There was a very high-profile case on, on Quebec's right of secession, and the Canadian Supreme Court effectively ruled that unilateral secession is illegal. You must hold a, a, a legitimate process, democratic process, and then engage in the process of negotiation for how that split should take place. And I think we're now starting to see the, the, the start of that debate in the United Kingdom. There's a lot of debate about Scotland and Scotland's future. And I think the argument has emerged there as well, that this is not something that can be unilaterally done. 
They would have to have a referendum, and then that referendum will act as a guide for the Scottish executive to engage in a proper discussion with Westminster about the terms of that separation. And it could be a very long and drawn out process. And I think that we should really be applying this in Southeast Europe, saying ideally, if you can come up with models of autonomy that are acceptable to both sides, then certainly that's well and good. But perhaps also it's, it's a question of, of, of bringing European values and norms into, the, into play and saying that, look, well, perhaps there are arguments for a consensual split, a negotiated discussion leading to division. Not saying it's either or, not saying one should be applied in one circumstance or another, but the European Union coming in. And I think we've had a very, very powerful message of the importance of this in the past few days with South Sudan. Precisely because this was a consensual split that took place, Sudan is now a member of the, Euro- uh, of, of, of the United Nations within five days of having declared independence. Kosovo, on the other hand, over three years later, has 76 recognitions out of the 193 members as it stands now of the United Nations. It has no immediate prospect of joining the United Nations. Its path to the European Union is held up because you've got five members that won't recognise it. It's membership of a whole raft of other international organisations, international bodies, UN-affiliated organs, is, is, is blocked. It can't get a dialing code. It can't get a top-level domain name. It can't play in, in, in the World Cup. It can't participate in the Olympics. And all of this, as I say, because a decision was made to pursue a unilateral declaration of independence. Interesting as, or not as it may be, my own position is, in actual fact, I see very good arguments for an independent Kosovo. This is not about saying that Kosovo shouldn't be independent. What this is about is saying that I think that the European Union, how it approached Kosovo, did it in a fundamentally wrong way. It pursued a unilateral solution instead of trying to look for options which might have allowed for a much more consensual split. It might have taken longer, but I think that there were very good arguments to say that this was a possibility. And in the case of Cyprus, I lived in Cyprus for many years. It's a small place. Too small, I think, to be divided. But nevertheless, maybe this has got to be something that is opened up for for greater discussion. On what terms could you see a consensual split between the two sides, if that is what they wanted? And I I believe that amongst many Greek Cypriots, as controversial as this may be, that they do look at the situation and ask themselves if if reunification is what they want under the terms that are on offer. They were very unhappy about the 2004 Annan plan, And I think that you still have a great deal of resentment. And I think that that's part of the problem that we're seeing in in the talks at the moment, that you have a leader who I think is genuine about trying to pursue reunification, but a large proportion of the population that's deeply sceptical about this. So where does the European Union perhaps come into, into this? And I think that this ties in with the initial points I made. I think if it's to have any credibility in, in pursuing a process of, of conflict resolution in Southeast Europe... Um, it's got to offer quite clearly the prospect of membership to the countries. And that's not a position that you are using at the moment. And it's causing a real problem, I think, in, in how we approach this. We're seeing it with Turkey. It's got very grave doubts about how serious the European Union is in terms of, re- in terms of allowing Turkey to join. And I think that that in its own way is also hampering a search for a solution in Cyprus. I think in the case of Bosnia... A lot of the parties don't see EU accession as a realistic prospect. So there's very little reason to engage in, in to actively with one another, positively with one another, in order to pursue this. Um, likewise, in Macedonia, although it's a candidate, um, again, I think that um, without a proper, clear statement to the effect that we are pursuing membership for Southeast European um, states in the European Union, I think we're we're seeing a dialing back of of, of progress that has been made, and quite seriously. Um, But again, it's not just about the carrot of EU accession. I think the European Union needs to think also about some of the sticks that it has in its arsenal. And this again comes back to the point that I made um, about what we saw in Cyprus, um, which is recognising that um, you cannot let up on the parties until, really until they've joined the European Union. 
you've got to be able to keep the pressure there. And it's not about sort of saying punishing one side by keeping it out. No, you make the judgment as to how far it's tried to pursue a peace settlement. But if it hasn't shown the willingness to engage in a proper dialogue and is now sitting back and thinking, well, we're just going to join the European Union and then we will reap the benefits of, of doing so to get a solution that we really want. You know, the European Union has got to be on the lookout for that and start thinking more seriously about how it can um, address this. So it's not really a case of the EU trying to punish countries for problems, but it has certainly has the right to ask for solutions. And I think it's also in an ideal position to help countries find those solutions. Thank you. Thank you.